Hello everyone, I'm Brian. Today I'm reacting to Where Does My God Live? Swami Sarvarpiananda. So, I thought this was kind of curious, because obviously there's the Abrahamic religion gods, then there's the Eastern gods, and well, where, they, where do they live? Let's go and give it a shot. Revered Swami Yogatmanandaji, uh, esteemed speakers, and my dear friends. Where does my God live? What a lovely question. When I first saw the subject, I fell in love with that. You know, what a wonderful question. It's a question that um, children ask. You know, you're saying, children ask, where is God? And it's a question that theologians and philosophers ask. It's a very philosophically deep question. Where is God? It's a question that saints ask. Um, not in a, in, a, in a doubting way, but in a, when you miss God, when the heart, when the saint's heart misses the presence of God. Where are you, my Lord? So in that sense, where is, where is God? And it's a question that skeptics ask. Atheists ask, where is your God, quote unquote? <laughs> where? So it's a wonderful question. It's a lovely question. And um, I'm going to ask it thrice in the next few minutes. The first pass from a Vedantic perspective, where does my God live? And immediately it strikes me the where is a space word. I don't know where asks a word, a place. Which place, which part of space, where does your God live? Or when is God? A time word. Why only where? When? Is God now, or was God in the past, or is God in the future? You know, I saw a big billboard, after death you will meet God. Uh, call 1800 something for the truth. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's interesting, after death, when you say after, it's a time word. So when is God? Another billboard, just like that, it said, heaven is a place. God exists, God is in heaven. So that's a space word. Where is God? When is God? And again, what is God? Your God, when you talk about God, what exactly are you talking about? You talk about a human being, you know what you're talking about. A table or a chair, you know what you're talking about. But what God, when you say God, what is God? What's God made of? What is God? So in uh, Vedanta, these are called Desha Kala Vastu, space, time, object. You can have a space question about God. Where is your God? You can have a time question about God. When is your God? And you can have an object question about God. What? Is? what? Which one? What exactly is God? And the answer in, in Vedanta is uh, the word for God is Brahman, which literally means the vast. And the answer in Vedanta is where is God? Everywhere. God is here, there, everywhere. When is God? God is every when. God is <laughs> in the past, when. God is now, God is in the future. God is eternal. What is God? God is everything. There is no thing apart from God. So everywhere, all the time, and everything is God, and yet not quite. If you go even deeper, when you it's only by accepting, assuming that there is something called space, then you say God is everywhere. Because you're already accepting, assuming everywhere is there. That there is space and then so God is somehow filling up the space. Assuming that there is time, then you say God is eternal. Assuming there are uh, objects, independently existing objects, then you say God pervades all of them. None of that is true, according to Vedanta. None of that is true. It's rather the other way around. Space is in God. God is not in space. It's, it's uh, not right. When you ask, where is your God? Vedanta will say, that's a wrong question. Not where is your God? Where is in God? The space, all space is in God. When is God? It's a wrong question. Because time itself is in God, is an appearance in God. Mm. Mm. What is God? When you say God is everything, You've already assumed everything exists and that somehow it's God. No, Vedanta says the other way around. That's a very interesting way to put it.
we times in God places in God I was hoping you would say something about the time everything appears in God everything at Vivekananda said once you know, in a poem written to one of his American disciples Mary Hale she wrote a poem uh, to Vivekananda I have understood what you have said what you have taught that all is God and Swami Vivekananda wrote back and said I have never taught such strange doctrine that all is God <laughs> all is not God only is that's Vedanta where is God no where is not God only is when is God when is not God only is what is God what objects are not God only is hmm. and then after that when we accept when we see we experience universe when we ask we're asking this question in this universe so then it makes sense to say if you say that there is space well there is we experience space then God must be everywhere and you accept time we experience time we are asking this question in time and we are bound by time so in that case God is eternal God is not temporary like everything else God is not we are all located in space limited in space but God is not limited in space we are all limited in time we have birth and death this program is a beginning and an end but God is not limited in time doesn't have a beginning or an end eternal Interesting. Um, this is kind of an example I kind of used with one of my coworkers, um, explaining there's an underlying reality, and he's saying that you know he doesn't even know if this reality is real. I was like, well, no. I mean, sure, you can say this this reality could be false, but there's an underlying reality causing this this thing, whatever this is, this experience as existing, whether it's fake or real. And he says he doesn't even know that. <clears throat> So the example I use is like say, imagine if this is in fact a computer program, a computer simulation to see what um, what would be the most successful human existence, I guess. This is existence number, I can't remember what the guru said, but just say 77. There's 76 other programs running before this one. And they're all still running simultaneously, but each parameter is slightly different to have obviously a different outcome in each of the um, programs. <clears throat> so in terms of our program, the underlying reality is the computer. It is on processing and the computer is not tied to our time, we are tied to the computer's time. Um, we are, our, our stuff in the world is not, God is not tied to it. The program is not tied to it. It is tied to the program. The time is tied to the program, not the pro not the program tied to the time. Um, the objects are not tied to the program, or the program is not tied to the object. The object is tied to the program. The space is not tied to the pro uh, the program. Wait, wait, the the program is not tied to the space. The space is tied to the program. The objects is not. The, the, the program's not tied to the objects, but the objects tied to the program. The program's not tied to the time, but the time's tied to the program kind of deal, where the program itself is the underlying reality, or God, and the things that the program's generating is this existence itself. And this is what I was trying to convey to him, that this program is the underlying reality. Obviously, we understand that, well, there's a computer running that program, there's someone that created that program, but the idea behind this experience and the underlying reality is what I'm really trying to get at. And each of us, we are, we are, we are entities, we are distinct entities, we are distinct persons and distinct things. God is not a thing among other things. God is that which is unlimited by things. So we, the way to put it is God is in all things and nothing is there apart from God. But that's already making some compromise with our experience. Uh, with our the way we experience the universe let me know if my explanation made sense or not I'm not I'm kind of curious well, that creates a problem you know just to say God is everywhere it's cheap oh uh, God is everything it's cheap God is eternal that's cheap too why is it cheap because the problem is 
aren't you just taking this universe and calling it God? You're just ch ch changing the name. Here's this world. Here are people. Here are tables and chairs. Here's the sky and the earth. Here are uh, quasars and quarks. And we call it the universe. And now you're just coming along and calling it God. What good does that do? What good does that do? Why not? Because this universe is the problem for us. Here is birth and death. Here is old age and sickness. Here is misery and sin and imperfection. See, this is the problem with pantheism, you see. Why um, religions object to Spinoza's pantheism, for example? It's because you are taking the, the universe and somehow it sounds cool to say everything is God. And yet that means God is subject to misery and death and, uh, and suffering and, uh, and the sickness and, and limitation. Then just call it the world. Why are you calling it God? Even worse, even worse. If you say God is everywhere. My problem is I don't, then in that case God must be here. If God is everywhere, God must be here. If God lives everywhere, God must be living here. But I don't see God here. Uh -huh. You see, it is an advantage to saying God is in heaven. Then if you, somebody asks, why can't I see God? Well, because God is in heaven. You're not in heaven. <laughs> there's, there's an advantage. There's an advantage to saying God is after death. What's the advantage? Then if you ask, why can't I experience God? Why can't I see God? Because it's after death. Didn't I tell you? Read the board. After death, you will see God. You are not dead yet. There's an advantage. There's an advantage. <laughs> <clears throat> and if you say God is everything, there's a problem because I don't see God in anything. I don't see, you see, God is everywhere. I don't see God anywhere. God is eternal all the time. I don't see God anytime. And God is in everything. I don't see God in one single thing also. That's the problem. Vedanta gets around this by saying that the difference that it is true that God is everywhere that God is in all things and God is eternal but why is it hidden from us it's hidden by ignorance that is hidden by not knowing not realizing not seeing what is already an open secret it's presented to us it's right here right now all the time in all things uh, but we don't see it and the reason we don't see it is it's ignorance there's an Upanishad um, Taittiriya Upanishad which tells us where is God and how to see God it says Satyam Jnanam Anantam Brahma infinite existence and uh, consciousness or infinite existence reality and knowledge infinite is Brahman Brahman is unlimited existence or being and unlimited awareness or consciousness that is Brahman now we know why the name for God, a term applied for God in Vedanta is Brahman. It literally means the vast, the unlimited. If it was not everywhere, it would be limited in space. If it was not all the time, it would be limited in time. And if there is anything other than God, it would be limited in object. There would be something other than God. All that's fine, but one may still persist. Okay, God is here. God is now. God is anything that we experience here. Show me. And Vedanta boldly takes up the challenge and says, yes, it's an open secret. We are experiencing God all the time. Where? Look at things which exist. God is defined as unlimited existence or unlimited reality. Look at things which exist. And we see this, you know, tables and chairs and people, they all exist. So are these things God? Not quite. These are all limited existences. Remember, we define God as unlimited existence. So these are all limited existences. But there's one thing in all of this which is unlimited and which is existence itself, being itself. Uh, in Vedanta, this is called Sat, pure being. It's like, you see, 10,000 waves in the ocean. Waves are continuously coming up and growing, rising and falling and disappearing. But one thing that doesn't rise and disappear, and, um, uh, you know, is water. Water is always there. The water of the ocean is always there. It comes up as waves and it disappears, but all the waves are nothing but that water. If you ask, where does water live in, in, uh, in, you know, in this ocean? Everywhere. But I see waves. That's water. Now I see no waves. That's water. 
I see bubbles, I see foam, I see surf, that's water. And the Upanishads talk about many such examples, the clay and pots, and there are various kinds of pottery. <laughs> are those God? Not quite. Are those clay? Not quite. But the reality of all of them is clay. The substance out of the, which they have all been made is clay. Exactly like that in this universe of all existing things. Yeah. Living and non-living, um, you know, concrete things like this and abstract things like a number or, you know, concepts and ideas or Plato's forms or whatever. All of them, notice one thing common to all of them. They exist. They are. That's why we are talking about them. So this unlimited existence in all existing things, this is God. This is the God of Vedanta, an unlimited being. A recent philosopher, I think the most brilliant um, thinker in the 20th century, Martin he Heidegger. He is the one who brought up this question of existence in Western thought again. Uh, and he said the deepest, widest, and the most fundamental question we can ask is the question of existence. Why is it deep? Because, um, you know, in science, for example, deep means like the body. You can talk of it, um, you know, from a physiological point of view. You can talk of it deeper from a biological point of view. Even deeper, you can talk about it from a chemical point of view. Even deeper, you can talk about it from a, a physical point, physics point of view, particles and all. But even deeper is existence itself, being itself. So it's the deepest question possible. It's the widest question possible because everything, you know, each, each branch of knowledge talks about only that. Biology talks about living things. Music talks about music, songs and instruments and all. Music doesn't talk about cells and tissues. <laughs> but there's one subject which talks about everything possible and that's existence. You so said, wait a minute, what about non-existence? Well, non-existence doesn't exist, so that's, <laughs> you can leave it out. <laughs> Heidegger says this. By the way, he was a Nazi, which goes to show you can be a brilliant thinker and not a particularly good human being at all. No. That's very interesting. Um, so, this is the idea of God in Vedanta. And Vedanta says this unlimited being, this unlimited consciousness, this unlimited bliss, this unlimited be uh, being consciousness itself is bliss, ananda or bliss. So that um, Brahman, the ultimate reality, God, is also called Sat Chit Ananda, existence, consciousness, bliss, or existence, awareness, bliss, Sat Chit Ananda. Where does God live? Where does my God live? My God lives in existence, Sat. Where does my God live? My God lives in consciousness, in awareness, in every experience that we have. One of the Upanishads says, Pratibodha Viditam uh, Amritatvam Vindate. In every experience, when you experience God, you attain immortality. <clears throat> but wouldn't you say that um, that God doesn't live in existence, but existence lives in God? And I couldn't remember what the second one was. God is in bliss, but bliss is in God. I'm wondering if he just maybe misspoken that. Because that's that's his original saying back when he's talking about how time is in God, objects are in God, and s objects time. Oh, and objects and place are within God instead of, instead of the reverse. So in e every experience is based on consciousness. Without consciousness, no experience. That pure consciousness, underlying consciousness, not the changing awareness that we are talking about here. Uh, that is God. God lives in chit, pure consciousness. Where does God live? God lives in ananda, in bliss, in fulfillment, in joy. The three greatest questions of philosophy. What is real? That's one branch of philosophy, ontology. It used to be called metaphysics at one time. And that's what we were arguing about, about reality. A co-worker is like, well, you know, whether you, whether you believe this reality is real or fake, the fact that there's still an underlying reality that's creating this reality or this falsehood without that reality this would not exist so something must exist for us to even question anything because if nothing exists there would be nothing to question and that's what I was trying to point out is the fact that you know whether this is false or real something must exist for us to even say 
do I exist? Hmm. Now, whether you really exist or not is not the point. It's just there is an underlying reality, an underlying truth that's creating this, whether it be real or false. It's irrelevant whether it's either one. Just this underlying reality is the whole point. <clears throat> How is knowledge possible? That's another question. Epistemology. And what is the purpose of all of this? What is, what is good? What is bad? What is uh, moral? What is immoral? What is beautiful and what is not beautiful? It used to be called ethics and aesthetics at one time. It's all clubbed under the, uh, under the branch. Now the new name is axiology. So philosophy Never consists of, of the greatest, most fundamental questions of, that we can ever ask. Ontology, epistemology, axiology. And very, very interesting, it struck me, the Vedanta idea of God, conception of God, being, consciousness, bliss, are actually answers to these three questions. What is ultimately real? Existence is real. But, uh, sat is the answer. What, how is knowledge possible? Chit, consciousness is the answer. What is the point of it all? Ananda, bliss is the answer. <laughs> sat, chit, ananda. And uh, even this is not, if this is not dramatic enough, Advaita Vedanta says, the real secret, the heart of Advaita Vedanta is this, this Sat Chit Ananda, this infinite being, infinite awareness, infinite fulfillment, is you. Tat Tvamasi, you are that. Where does God live? God lives in you. That's not quite right. You live God there. is you. But don't mistake it for you, the individual person. That's megalomania, that's craziness. <laughs> That's why it has, it has to be handled carefully, this truth. Tattvamasi, uh, you are that, that thou art. Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. So God does not live in you. God is you in reality, in knowledge, in enlightenment. You and God are the same reality. One of our Swamis, senior Swamis told a young monk who told me in his old age that this Swami, he, he suddenly he said to me, it touched me in the forehead like this and I, I was startled because of sudden touch in the forehead and he that this old Swami said to me there there that one which got startled which which shrank back immediately that one there is no rascal go called God other than that one <laughs> in Bengali Shala <laughs> so it's just the this Vedantic uh, statement what we call God and what we call you truly understood, truly understood, not on a surface level, never on a surface level, is one and the same thing. But I hear you, what you are saying, what you are thinking in the mind, ah, that's all very metaphysical, that's all very philosophical, all very abstract. Let's get real. <laughs> Second time I'll ask this question, where does your God live? Where does my God live? The same Upanishad says, you want to know where God lives, want to find God, experience God? Look in your heart. You, you see there is a, there's in the cave of your heart, there is a sacred space. In the sacred space of the cave of your heart, you will find God. Yo veda nihitam gohayam parame vyoman. You, you can see God, you can experience God in the sacred space of your heart. In the devotee's heart, the beloved dwells. In the yogi, the meditator's heart, is the divine light shining. It is hidden. What, how is it hidden? It is hidden by inattention. It is hidden by the movements of our mind, the fluctuations of our mind. Still the mind, the yogi says, attend to what is within, not to what is outside. We do not see the divine within because we are continuously pouring ourselves out into the world outside. I'm translating from the Upanishads. It is, one, it is a spiritual hero who averts the gaze, you know, sort of, stops the gaze from going outwards and looks inwards and stills the mind and sees the divine within. Where does your God live? Your God lives in the heart of the devotee, in the heart of the one who loves God, in the heart of the one who attends, who pays attention. Once more we shall ask, you know, all right, that's, you know, inwardness, but what about this world? Where does God live? Where does your God live? Sri Ramakrishna, Swami Vivekananda's guru, he once said, Shiva Jiva Seva. 
serve all sentient beings knowing them to be God serve all sentient beings knowing them to be God where does God live everywhere in everything and at all time great but Vivekananda said my God the, the poor my God the ignorant my God the wicked so especially God lives in action God lives in service God lives in love in this world where you are engaged with this world my God the poor my God the sick my God the ignorant my God the wicked he says if it be true that God is your Vedanta says everywhere and everything and nothing is there other than God then the things where we do would not expect to find God there actually God is more manifest where does your God live God my God lives in service my God lives in love my God lives in the dynamic action where we pour ourselves out in the service of God in in all sentient beings, especially in humanity, most manifest in humanity. Here also it's hidden. Here also it's hidden. It's hidden. We see human beings. Where's God? It's hidden. It's hidden by our, uh, our uh, uh, greed. It's hidden by lust. It's hidden by anger. Kama, Krodha, Lobha. When anger, greed and lust are converted into love, into sacrifice, and then into service you see God in all sentient beings so three three times we asked this question three times we have found answers uh, one the most vast metaphysical answer all encompassing God and God only satyam jnanam anantam brahma infinite existence consciousness is brahman the vast everywhere all the time in everything but hidden by ignorance revealed by knowledge <clears throat> Second time we ask, where does your God live? In yourself, in your heart. Hidden by inattention, by distraction, revealed by attention, by turning inwards, by meditation. And third time when we ask this question, where does your God live? It lives in suffering. It lives in sorrow. It lives in the worst of places, in the worst of people. And it is hidden by our ambition, greed, anger, lust. And it is revealed by love. And it is revealed by sacrifice and expressed in service. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hmm. Yeah, well, uh, <clears throat> I thought it would have said like ignorance there, which he did repeat over here. <clears throat> That's very interesting. I, I kind of like the way he phrased um, where does my God live? Because I don't think throughout watching all of this that I heard <clears throat> or just maybe I didn't quite understand it but that existence lives within God or let's say uh, objects live within God places live within God and time lives within God or Brahman I much prefer Brahman than God but I've also remember a certain comment because I would say everything is God and it says, no, you're saying it wrong. It's, uh, there is only God. So I understand that what he's, the way he's phrasing it. To me, those are two, one and the same, but I can see how it, it, it isn't in, the, in a lot of sense, especially after Swami here has, has said something about it. <clears throat> I mean, if you say everything is God, God is not, I don't think it's, I don't see that as being limited because. <clears throat> I don't know. To me, it just it doesn't seem limited, but I could see it also being limited, even though it's like unlimited, because it's obviously limited by what's available. Even everything is limited. <laughs> I guess that's the I guess that's the way. Everything is still limited. Hmm. Time is also limited. So. Objects are limited, even though it's everything. Space is limited, even though there's a vast amount of space, a near infinite space. And time is limited, even though there. Are, well, I don't think time has. I don't think time is near limit, limitless or limit or unlimited, because once the contraction begins from the Big Bang to a singularity, then in a sense, that's kind of the end of time. <laughs> so yeah, and okay, that makes that makes a lot more sense. Even though you say everything, everything is still limited. Even they say space, the vastness, 
the inexplorable vastness of space is so limited. Okay, so I get it. I get it now. I get it. I will not say God, though. I will say Brahman. That, to me, that it's not as tainted of a, of, of a word for me. Anyways, that's my reaction to where does my God live, so I'm Mr. Rappi and I feel like my content, please consider subscribing, thumbs up, thumbs down, down below. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next vid.